Hello and welcome to Did You Know Gaming Extra. Today we're taking a look at some trivia for several Nintendo 64 games. It seems like only yesterday that we did an extra video on N64 titles, but it's actually been well over a year since last time, so we're back at it again. And what better way to kick off the video than with some secrets from a few of the N64's most beloved titles, the original Mario Party trilogy. All three titles have one peculiar unused scenario that can still be found in their data, and even put back into the game using GameShark codes. The scenario in question is an unused instance of there being no minigame to play. If there isn't a minigame to play when a character's turn ends, the panel behind their icon and stats will turn yellow, and a large no-game graphic will pop up on screen. The game will continue to the next round, completely skipping the minigame segment. However, if it's the last round of the game, a large Game Over graphic will pop up on screen instead, and the game will end as it normally would. This data is still within Mario Party 2 and 3, and can also be triggered with GameShark codes, but it acts a little differently. The scenario plays out the same way, but the graphic for No Game doesn't appear. If it's the last turn of the game, not only will no Game Over graphic appear, but the game actually continues onto a new round that shouldn't exist. For example, turn 20 of a 20 turn game will become turn 21. Mario Party 3 also has another interesting secret. Under normal conditions when starting the game for the first time, all characters are unlocked from the offset. This is despite the fact that the back of Mario Party 3's game box alludes to how players can even unlock new characters in the one-player challenge, something which is just entirely not true. What's interesting is that, should the game be forced into the main menu with an unutilized save, which means the player has managed to bypass the game's attempt to load any sort of save file data, both Waluigi and Daisy will be unselectable during a match setup. Not only this, but they'll appear as otherwise unused question mark icons. Furthermore, from within the game's debug settings menu, it's possible to enable the characters, making it clear that the intention was for both of these characters to initially be unlockable, rather than playable from the offset. It's likely that this idea was dropped fairly late during development, as it was used as an advertisable feature on the game's box. Before we move on to the next fact, we'd like to talk about this episode's sponsor, which combines a charitable cause with a chance to win an amazing prize. Omaze is an online fundraising platform that partners with many incredible charities and gives entrants the chance to win prizes. Today, Omaze is running a campaign with Schools on Wheels, and they're giving Did You Know Gaming viewers the chance to win a $20,000 Dream Gaming PC if you participate. Entrants have a chance to splurge on whatever components they want, finally letting you play your favorite PC titles on max settings. You can even choose from top-of-the-line peripherals like headsets, controllers, and monitors. You could even build your dream video editing or graphic design rig instead, the choice is yours. As we mentioned, this campaign helps Schools on Wheels, who work with thousands of homeless students, connecting them to volunteers providing free tutoring to children who live in shelters, motels, vehicles, and on the streets. Every entry into this campaign will help Schools on Wheels give struggling children a hand with their education. Omaze and Did You Know Gaming want you to have a rad summer, and make a rad difference. Score 150 extra entries with the code RADNESS150 when you enter for the chance to win $20,000 for your own dream gaming computer, all while supporting a great cause. Enter at omaze.com forward slash DYKG before July 2nd. And now, back to the trivia. One of the big reasons that the N64 is so fondly remembered today is because of Rare and the games they created. We all know that Rare made great N64 titles like Conker's Bad Fur Day, Perfect Dark, and Banjo-Kazooie, and that Rare owned the rights to all of these franchises. But this wasn't always the case. Unlike Conker and Perfect Dark, Rare actually created the Banjo franchise for Nintendo. This means Banjo-Kazooie was a first-party Nintendo IP, as shown by this trademark approved in May 1997 for Banjo-Kazooie, showing that the owner was Nintendo of America Inc. and not Rare. Nintendo owned the franchise for five whole years until 2002, when ownership of the IP was transferred from Nintendo to Rare. This lines up with the Microsoft acquisition of Rare, which was likely linked to Nintendo giving the franchise rights back to Rare. And in some ways, this news is a bit surprising considering what Rare did with the IP, especially in the sequel. 
with some of the humor not exactly being family friendly. In Banjo-Tooie, there's an extremely rare chance for a slightly dirty bit of humor to make an appearance. Inside Grunty Industries, whilst progressing to the worker quarter of the facility, there is a 1 in 1000, or perhaps an even slimmer chance, of a rare event occurring, involving a spotlight emitting from the inside of a restroom. If the player gets close, it's possible to hear one of the building's worker rabbits having what can only be assumed to be a rather intense bout with either constipation or the runs. Another beloved rare creation is Diddy Kong, and the character's N64 title, Diddy Kong Racing. But before trying their hand at a karting title, Rare were actually trying to make a real-time strategy game, and after some experimentation, ended up throwing in the towel. Rare's Lee Musgrave told Nintendo Life, just before Diddy Kong Racing, there was a month's worth of work on a strategy game that I did with Chris Stamper, but that was in the style of Command & Conquer and not related. I rendered a few catapults, but other than that, it didn't go anywhere and died after a month. We had a go at it, but in the end, it looked like the racing game had more legs. Musgrave, Stamper, and a few other developers set their sights on a racing game they called Wild Cartoon Kingdom. This game actually drew a lot of inspiration from Disneyland, including the park's layout and attractions. After a lot of trial and error, the team implemented an adventure mode similar to that in the final Diddy Kong Racing, before the game's title was changed to Adventure Races. It would then be reworked into the less fantasy-inspired Pro-Am 64 and reworked yet again into Diddy Kong Racing. While working on Diddy Kong Racing, Rare also had the chance to create what would later become one of the most highly praised first-person shooters for home consoles, GoldenEye 007. The game wound up having some alterations made to avoid comparisons to real-world events that occurred. When asked by Censored Gaming about why the hunting knife isn't in the final Japanese game, Martin Hollis, the game's director, revealed more details about why the weapon was removed from the Japanese localization. He stated that it was related to the Kobe child murders, a horrific incident in Japan which involved both child murder and knife attacks. In order to not upset Japanese players, it was decided that the knife should simply be removed from the game entirely. This decision also carried over to the Japanese localization of Perfect Dark, which is a sort of spiritual successor to Goldeneye. Perfect Dark's combat knife isn't usable in the Japanese game, presumably for the same reason. Perfect Dark had a few more alterations made, though this was after its release, and even long after the N64 had been discontinued. With Perfect Dark's Xbox Live Arcade iteration, the N-Bomb weapon had its name changed to the N-Grenade. It's generally agreed that the reason behind this change must have been because the term N-Bomb is almost exclusively used in modern times to refer to someone using a racial slur. From one way of causing offense to another, this time with Konami's Mystical Ninja starring Goemon. Some changes had to be made with the game's script during localization, with the Japanese version of the game having a fair few instances where characters refer to the Flake Gang and Peach Mountain Shoguns using the term Okama, a homophobic and transphobic slur within the Japanese language. Depending on the context, the word is considered to be derogatory, and refers to not just gay men, but transgender women, male crossdressers, or just effeminate men. The members of the in-game organizations are all men who dress or act in a flamboyantly effeminate manner. When the game was localized for the English language, all instances of the word Okama were either completely removed or replaced with a phrase that's, frankly, no more accepting, the rather detrimental term weirdo. While most of the games we've mentioned so far have been well received, one game we want to talk about wasn't so highly praised. WWF No Mercy suffered from a notorious issue involving a massive memory glitch which would result in the player's save data being deleted randomly at any time. The issue wound up being fixed with the release of a second edition of the game, which customers could request to replace their old copies, though this new version came with its own caveats in PAL regions. For some reason, when creating this new release, it was decided that wrestlers would no longer be able to bleed, though animations were left intact. What is also strange is that, despite the characters not being able to shed blood, first blood match types still remained in the game. 
From a cut to an addition, when Resident Evil 2 was ported to the N64, it included 16 new in-game documents known as the X-Files. Not only were these documents a sly reference to the popular sci-fi show X-Files, they served to expand the lore of the franchise and tie Resident Evil 1, 3 and Code Veronica together. However, two of these X-Files incorporate something else, two non-canon audio dramas released exclusively in Japan. The files Robert's Note and Op Instructions acknowledge places and events from both The Little Runaway Sherry and the female spy Ada Lives dramas. These audio dramas were released in March and April 1999, about six months before the N64 port's debut. Or, in other words, they were probably in production before the X-Files were even considered for the port. Another thing worth noting is that the file Chris's Report roughly summarizes the plot of Resident Evil 1, including key story elements and plot twists. Since the first Resident Evil never released on the N64, this entry basically spoiled the story of the first game for any player that only had a Nintendo 64 and might want to go back and play it. And, as per usual, it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. This time around, we're going to take a look at a reference that can be found within Fallout 4. When the player visits the General Atomics Galleria and enters the diner, they'll find that the diner is being run entirely by two General Atomic robots, who inform the player that they are there to serve them. When questioned on how they intend to serve the player, or when they're informed that the player is not hungry, they will retaliate with violence. This entire situation is actually in reference to an episode of the popular 60s show, The Twilight Zone, called To Serve Man, in which the story's plot follows a race of aliens who are seemingly trying to help mankind, only for it to be revealed in the end that they are merely carrying a book titled To Serve Man, a cookbook with instructions on how to cook and serve human beings. Did you also know that Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire were going to have Pokemon not featured in the final release of the game? Or that the Japanese version of Super Smash Bros. Melee has some interesting differences to the Western release? For more trivia, check out our videos on Game Boy Advance and GameCube Facts. Thanks for watching, really appreciate it. Uh, I know things have slowed down lately, but you know, um, it's been it's been a hard time, but we're, we're trying our best and uh, I hope that you guys are enjoying the videos regardless and I hope that you guys are, are looking after yourself. Stay crunchy, stay strong, you got this.